start with this, and I'm going to really focus today's presentation on this idea of equality and equity. So whilst we've um, maybe been talking about a whole range of things, and uh, Mari gave a great presentation this morning, there'll be a segue for that as well, I want to talk about this idea of inequalities. It's actually fundamental to Australian society. And to start us with this quote, which is from a book um, by Fiona Stanley, who many of you will know of, uh, Margot Pryor and Sue Richardson, and they say, a society that is good to children is one with the... Sm I've tried memorising this, I can't do it. It's one with the smallest possible inequalities for children, with the vast majority of them having the same opportunities from birth for health, education, inclusion and participation. And that's the starting place for all of this. So we're really trying to think about how do we make a difference to inequalities. But I also want to put this into the kind of mix of our conversation this morning. This is from James Heckman. He's my favourite Nobel Prize winning economist that I like to throw out there. And in our area, I've been in this area for a long time, the people that have made the most difference in accelerating us into policy are actually <coughs> economists. So they play a really important role in our translation into policy. And he says, once a child falls behind, he or she is likely to remain behind. Impoverished early environments, and that means all of the environments are powerful predictors of adult failure on a number of social and economic dimensions. So it's that reminder to us, not that you guys need a reminder, but a reminder to us about the important window of opportunity we have with young children to really make a difference to the society that we have uh, for the future. So inequalities, I could sort of do a whole slide here on, um, and a whole show on inequalities and the inequalities we have on outcomes in Australia. Income inequality sits um, very much at the heart of it, and there's a few slides there to give you a sense of um, the differences we have in income inequality between the rich and the poor. But I want to not focus on inequalities per se. I want to talk about inequalities as the outcome, but I want to talk about how we respond to inequalities and the sorts of things that we might do. So this, this talk today, this conversation we're going to be having um, is really trying to put forward some of the ideas on what we might do. So when we're thinking about what we might do, often people think about equality of provision, the sorts of things that let's give everybody the same. But the problem with that is, if we give everybody the same, we actually end up with inequality of outcome. And actually what we should be doing is thinking about this idea of equity, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about equity. This idea of giving people what they need when they need it. And that's a really tricky idea when you're trying to think about provision. And that means provision of services, provision of how we develop our communities but it's certainly moving away from the one size fits all. Now, sadly, this is reality. And um, I don't say this uh, jokingly, this is really reality. So, here are some results. These are the results actually from the 2015 Australian Early Development Census. Oh no, I changed it, this is the 2018 hot off the press, uh, 2018 Australian Early Development Census results, children developmentally vulnerable on two or more domains of development, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But So in our wealthiest areas, 6.5, not zero. Some of you might think this should be zero in our wealthiest areas. It's an important reminder. 6.5% of children developmentally vulnerable in our wealthiest areas Three times the amount, 18.5. Now, if you're developmentally vulnerable on two or more domains when you start school, that is not a great start to school. And your likelihood is if you're both disadvantaged and doing badly, you will remain disadvantaged and doing badly throughout your schooling. That's an important reminder about the importance of how you start is where you track along, especially if you're disadvantaged. So right here, right now, this is actually our reality in Australia. This is not me making it up. This is not me getting on my soapbox, which I tend to do. This is actually the reality. So in thinking about that, I want to put up a definition of inequity so we're kind of on the same page when we're talking about it. And the important part of this definition is this idea of remediable differences. In other words, there are things we could and should be doing that make a difference for kids. And that's what I want to focus on, this idea of remediable differences, this idea of a kind of call to action. Hey, what could we be doing that's actually starting to make a difference? Not next year, not in 20 years' time, but maybe like tomorrow. 
So let me just go through this idea of equi inequities and how they really play out. So I want to start off with this idea of geographic inequities. What is it about where you live that makes a difference to children's development? And what would be a presentation without Logan, right? I just felt, you know, you couldn't go to Queensland and not present on Logan. And I have presented in Logan as well. Um, so this is a picture of Logan. Many of you um, will recognise it if you live in the area. And this is looking at CIFA, which is our socioeconomic index for areas. It's um, from the previous 2011 census. But anyway, the, the way these maps work is the darker the colour, the worse the outcome. So you can see there are some pretty poor areas of Logan, but there are also some not so poor areas in Logan. And I have to say, most even disadvantaged communities in Australia have this level of heterogeneity. We don't really have very many places in Australia where we're just poor everywhere. And this is, oh, this is looking at the percentage of children who attended preschool. So once again, red is bad, so low percentage of children attending preschool. So um, I don't know if you recall the previous slide, there were areas that were kind of doing okay, but they're not doing okay so much in terms of attending preschool. In fact, none of the areas are in Logan. This is from 2009, 12 and 15. A little bit of improvement in 15, but it's kind of not magic really, is it? And this is the proportion of children developmentally vulnerable, again over 9, 12 and 15 on one or more domains. And you can see there's a little bit of movement here and there, and this is this heterogeneity and heterogeneity over time that happens. But also the reminder to us, and this is going to be really important, um, I think as a takeaway message, is it's really hard to shift outcomes for a whole population quickly. There are very few levers we have that can magically change things for children rapidly. And they certainly probably sit in our tax reform and welfare reform. So I think we need to remind ourselves to not really set people up by going, hey, how come you haven't changed your ADC in three years? You're, you know, you must be doing something terrible. So just a reminder that outcomes at a population level are slow moving and we need to think about other metrics, other indicators that are faster moving where we know, hey, if we change that, we're likely to see outcomes change over time. And service inequities. Um, I could really soapbox about services for a long time, but I won't. But we already have a multi-billion dollar service industry that we already fund. And I would argue we are not delivering on addressing inequities through this really powerful infrastructure that we already have. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to show you several examples here. This is looking at where speech pathologists lie in Melbourne. This is Melbourne. And uh, this is, you'll, you won't be surprised to know, and this is CIFA, so blue is rich, red is poor. Now look at that, all of the speech pathologists are in the richer suburbs, and I don't think any of you are going to fall off your chair to know that, right? And then we have a look at the AD, this was the back then, the ADI results, and basically the same thing, red is higher vulnerability, blue is lower, and once again you can see speech pathologists not where there are problems with language. So it's not like we don't have them, they're just not in the places where the problems actually are. This is inequitable service distribution. I could put up a number of services and you would see exactly the same thing. And um, particularly here in Queensland, I could put it up for rural and regional areas and you would really see the same thing. So, so service misdistribution is a problem. Then I want to talk about the healthcare system. This is a very nice paper that was done by Kim Dalziel, looking at the percentage of Medicare spending against different income levels. And I want you to look at these two bits. So first of all, if you look here at GPs, and this is the proportion against each of the quintiles, you go, hey, look at that. Percentage spending on each quintile looks the same. That looks fantastic except that we know more disadvantaged kids are more likely to have problems, so we should actually see higher uptake of GPs in lower income. But this is still not too bad. But look at the specialists. This is highest versus lowest income. So we have inequitable access to health care now. And I've sort of been talking about this idea we kind of need to gonski health care. So, and sadly, almost everyone here in the room will know what I mean. But, you know, this idea of what's the right equity models that ensure that children, all children, can get access to the best care when they need it. 
Now, we don't have that in Australia right now. For many of you, if you're working anywhere in the healthcare system, you will feel that. And then finally, I want to talk about um, education, and in particular, early childhood education and care, but I'll talk a little bit about schools. This was a little piece of work we did. We looked at the percentage of children developmentally vulnerable on one or more domains of the Australian Early Development Census, and whether they didn't or did attend preschool. And we said, what's the relationship between just attending preschool, that's the only data we have, and developmental vulnerability? And this is the highest income, and this is the lowest income. So here's the message for this. This is what we call an association analysis, so I can't sort of say it's causal, but have a look here. Those children who did not attend preschool did more poorly, whether you were rich or poor. Those children who did attend preschool did better, so lower, lower levels of vulnerability, whether you were rich or poor. Fabulous, right? And here is the equality versus equity argument in play. There is still the same difference between the high and low income families. So early childhood education and care, equality, early childhood education and care, not equity, because it has not closed the gap. The gap remains. And it is the gap that is a problem for Australia. And in case you think I'm just making all of this up, um, here is a report that came out of UNICEF. I don't know if any of you saw this. This was looking at inequalities in education um, across the world, actually. And uh, you'll see Australia right here. So Australia, in the bottom third of all high-income countries in terms of inequalities for education, and we win the prize because we're low in pre uh, preschool or early childhood education and care, low in primary and low in secondary. So we are right up there as unequal education system across the whole spectrum. Education um, is really the greatest public health platform we have. And I just don't think it's kicking the sort of goals that it could. In my view, it kind of punches below its weight, particularly around inequalities. So this is inequity. This is inequity in a number of our systems right here, right now. So what can be done? And that's really what I want to focus on now. So I want to talk about the N of one, one child. Now, um, I'm also uh, still a practicing paediatrician. It's before lunch, so I can tell you I focus on poo. So it's OK, even though I know some of you are in. Um, and I think the N of one is still really important. And if you want to be grounded, talk to children about poo for a few hours, and that will ground you. Um, however, um, a long time ago, um, as a paediatrician, I had this real passion. I could see that there were great inequalities for Australia's children. And I knew I couldn't do what I needed to do if it was just N of one, N of one, N of one. And the N of one is still really important, don't get me wrong. And there is great and enormous um, satisfaction and passion when you're seeing still one family. And I can tell you, fixing poo problems is right up there with uh, job satisfaction. But the question is, and this is the question I think you're trying to ask here, which is how can we keep populations of children healthy and developing well? And the answer to that is not the same answer of how do I keep an N of one well, but it's related. So how do we keep populations of children healthy? That's the real challenge. And um, that's what we want to talk about. So um, this is a quote from Linnell Briggs. Now, Linnell Briggs, interestingly, is now heading up the Aged Care Commission, which I think is interesting. But anyway, I want to just highlight this bit here about complex and these wicked sort of problems, because I think we're kind of out of silver bullets. So I wouldn't want to start, stand up here and go, hey, I've got the program, just go and do this and all be well. We're in this really mucky space where things are complex and they require complex thinking. And what I really liked about this quote is they often require broader, more collaborative, and that's what you're really doing here, and innovative approaches. And this last bit, which I love, which is they may result in the occasional failure or need for policy change or adjustment. It's like, oh! <gasps> policy failure, but really that's what we're up to. We have to be experimenting, we have to be testing, and we have to be willing to say, that's not going well, let's stop it, let's try something different. And we have to be given the bandwidth to be able to do that because we are in a mucky space that involves human beings. So um, 
I was really pleased. I was having a look at um, the work um, that's been done by Nature Play, and you've got each of these um, on your tables. And um, that's really an ecological framework. And if any of you are um, a social scientist yourself or come from that background, you'll recognise this as kind of Bron from Brenner's social systems theory, which has been, I think, borrowed um, quite, quite well, I think, into the early childhood sort of conversations. And this idea that the child lives in the family, lives in a community and lives in society. And therefore, there are child, community and policy level things that we could do that could make a difference. And I always look at this as kind of the circles of opportunity um, rather than the circles of complexity. So what are the different things we could be doing that might make a difference for children? And in particular, I'm very interested in this idea of community and system level things and the sort of ideas that you might be able to do. Because if we're going to make a difference to populations of children, we need to think about the kind of mechanisms we have. And obviously, where you live is a really important mechanism. And of course, this is about the geographic inequities, um, which I've already spoken about. But interestingly, it's also about this idea of place-based approaches and place-based reform. And um, if you've been sort of um, following the policy literature and policy kind of interest, you'll know there's a huge amount of interest in place. Place as an opportunity to co-design and to think about, hey, can we make communities different so that they're better places for families and children? And it's a really interesting moment in time, I think, to be standing up here and talking to you for this summit to be on, to, for Nature Play's interest in this area and for the policy environment to be really moving very purposefully, I think, into this idea of place. And the question is, what are we going to do when we get there that's not going to um, squander the opportunity, I guess, that we have and make sure that we're moving in a direction where we can say, hey, in 10 years' time, our communities look different. So in case you're interested, in, and um, I've, I've said that these slides can be made available, so if you're interested, um, so these are two pieces of work that the Centre for Community Child Health, where I uh, work, have done looking at what do we know, what's going on, it's a little bit old, the what's going on, so that's kind of a, kind of a daily feast actually in Australia at the moment, um, but this one might interest you as well, which is the evidence about what we know, and I have to say there isn't masses of evidence um, there's evidence um, about associations, there's evidence about what we think, but the actual hard evidence is if you do this and these are the sort of outcomes, that's emerging. That's where we're at now. We're at the opportunity to start doing that. And I, I'm really interested in these kind of system levers for change. So um, if we're thinking about communities, what are those kind of systems that we can pull, those system levers that are likely to make a difference? And they won't sit in one sector. We're kind of kidding ourselves if we think one sector is going to cure it all. It's got to be health, it's got to be education, it's got to be infrastructure, it's got to be the social sector. Because children, as it turns out, don't compartmentalise themselves that way. So. Um, this is a kind of scheme, I guess, of thinking about what are the sorts of levers we might like to consider in thinking about this idea of system, place-based system reform. And my interest, this is a sort of interest I have, is how do you use data and evidence to drive some of that system change so that you know you're heading in the direction you want to know. What are the diagnostics you need to know to know where your starting point is? And what are the same metrics you need to know, hey, we're heading in the right direction? And so there are a number of things here about using improvement for change, this idea of innovation. And I wouldn't want to stand up here and go, well, just use the evidence and don't innovate. I think innovation is fundamental, but it has to be innovation that you have a sense of what are we doing here. Then this idea of implementation, which is about how do we do better with what we know? How do we use indicators to drive change? Relational practice. It's, this is a bit of a segue. Um, I was at a meeting the other day and uh, Daniel Petrie was at the meeting. I don't know if you know who Daniel Petrie is. He's written that book, Father Time, for those of you who are interested. But he's also a really big um, venture capitalist and innovator. And he's of the view, probably rightly, that a number of our services are going to be replaced by robots. And um, things even like surgeons will be replaced by robots. But there are certain industries that will never be replaced by robots because they require relational practice and working with families will be one of them. So diagnosing, you're going to be diagnosed, they're going to do your genetics, and they're going to give you the right medication, but the other stuff, how's your life going, how are your kids going, that will never be replaced by um, robots because they don't have the algorithms for humanity. Well, not yet anyway. 
Um, but what I want to talk about is this idea of systems. And this is often how we think about systems. I'm off in my little area, I'm doing well, and I'm not part of a system. But actually we are, we are part of systems. And so um, what I'd like to talk about is this idea of indicators and the indicators that help us drive change as a system. And so to do that, I want to go back to my little ecological model here and talk about these community system level change, talk about place, and talk to you specifically about this project, which is the Kids and Community Study. Um, if you're interested, this is, um, and you're interested in the science behind it, um, this is our protocol paper. This is a really cool article that came out in the conversation, so if you want to have a read of that, that's our whole study um, that was in the conversation. So, let's start. First of all, I want to just acknowledge all the team members. So, these people here are my co-investigators. I don't know if you recognise some of their names. Hopefully this one here is in the room, but um, I don't know if Jeff's here. Um, so, he's a Queenslander. But the important thing about this project is, number one, it was multi-state, and number two, it was multidisciplinary. And I can't um, emphasise enough the importance of collaborations across disciplines. We are gone with, you know, I'm from the health centre, I'm not going to ride in my white horse and go, we're here now, we'll save the day. You know, we all bring to these very complex issues a number of disciplines and thinkings, and it's only when we're all in the room together that we have a big Barney and then we work out what we're really on about. The other thing is, um, if you ever want to give yourself high blood pressure, you should have this many partners on your project and run teleconferences. Um, so there's a direct relationship between my blood pressure and every teleconference. Um, oh, hang on. That's going. How do I go back? Here we go. Um, and so you can see Queensland Education and also uh, Queensland Health were part of the group. So we actually had a number of the state and uh, state uh, health and education departments, NGOs, but. This is what it's about. This is what it means when you start to get a whole lot of different perspectives to the table, but not so great for teleconferences. So, uh, conceptually, and what was really interesting was hearing those kids, conceptually we came up uh, quite a long time ago actually with this idea that we focus a lot on the services and that's a really important part of it, but actually there are a number of other community environments we're interested in, which is the physical domain, which is the built environment, the social domain, which is social capital, neighbourhood attachment, services, governance, citizen engagement, having a say. I tell you, those kids, I didn't talk to any of them, but they all came up with these domains. And um, community socioeconomic status. So we sort of pushed ourselves and said, okay, well, what is it beyond SES? And we use the Australian Early Development Census. So just so you know, Australian Early Development Census um, been around since 2009. We just did the 2018, so two, 10 years now really, of data collection every three years about children's development in these domains and reported by teachers on children on every child in Australia starting school every three years. We are the only country in the world that has these sort of data. And in my view, slightly biased because we did actually lead the initial effort on this, but in my view, this has been a game changer in, in people being able to say, these data allow me to say something about my community, not the community down the road, not the big you know, statewide aggregation, but my community. And the 2018 data were just, and we had 96.4% in, um, I looked it up, um, in 2018. And we sort of went, you know what, we're really interested in the ADC, we think it's a great marker, but there's a lot of association between poor ADC results and being poor. But what about the kind of interesting, what we call off-diagonal communities? What's happening there? So let me explain what I mean by off-diagonal. So what we know is there's this kind of really strong relationship between developmental vulnerability and neighbourhood disadvantage. And they're kind of the on-diagonal, and you can be on-diagonal advantaged, um, wealthy area doing well, or on-diagonal disadvantaged, which is I'm a poor area doing badly. But here's the fun part. What about these guys? Better than expected. These, these, are, the, these are the really fun dual parts, which is this off-diagonal positive. So poor areas doing well. Wow, what's going on there? And these ones, worse than expected. So wealthy areas doing badly. Well, what's going on there? What's undoing children in those areas? 
And that's kind of what we talked about. What's happening in these off-diagonal areas that might be really interesting, especially when they're right next to on-diagonal areas? What's, what's, what's the difference? And, you know, we originally had these lovely anecdotes where people would tell us, well, the areas doing better have a pub. And you kind of go, what? But you know what the pub is? The pub is a social centre. And so they had great social capital. Not sure about the alcoholism, but they definitely had better social capital. That only happens when you go out and talk to people. So right here, right now, me sitting in Melbourne, I wouldn't have a clue. But when you go out and talk to people, that's when they tell you these stories. And so this is what it looks like when you map it against the ADC. So here we've got an um, off-diagonal positive. So this is a poor area doing well, right next to an on-diagonal disadvantaged. Poor area doing badly, as you'd expect. So that was kind of our MO. That's what we were kind of interested in. But we're also interested in this idea which I talked about before. Are there these other community level factors, not just SES? The problem with SES is everything just, everyone just throws up their hands and goes, it's too hard, can't change it, move on. And then you don't get any momentum. And we were really interested to say, well, hang on, we must be able to do something, it must be about more than that. And mainly because when we look statistically, SES didn't account for all those differences between the communities. It accounted for some, but not all. So there was something else in there that was really interesting. And these are these different areas that I showed you on the other slide that we were gonna start measuring and going out there and seeing what we could find. So we went to 25 uh, local communities around all around the eastern seaboard. Another thing, if you want to do things and make it as hard as possible, do it in as many states as possible. Um, but this is the kind of stuff you need to do, right? And we did quantitative data. So uh, we had surveys that went out into the community. My little segue story is um, we wanted to use the Australian electoral role to actually do Dropbox for the survey, which is what we wanted to do. And they told us our research wasn't research. Um, and um, we made such a big fuss. Now you can do this sort of research and use the Australian electoral role. So that's my little win. Um, thank you. Um, we also used um, census and service information. So we were keen to make sure from a sustainability point of view, you could use the data that were already available. We use GIS, which I'll show you in a moment. That's Geographic Information Systems, which if you've got any techno geek in here, you're gonna love. And uh, we also asked the survey, the services themselves about their own networks. It was a network survey. Um, this is what GIS is all about. This is really interesting stuff and highly relevant to the ideas of um, outdoor play. So GIS allows us to look at walkability and cyclability, traffic, destinations like early childhood education and care, greenness, how nice it is, and we cannot underestimate niceness. You had that um, lovely young woman here telling us that one of the things she didn't like about her community was the litter. And that's really important. Nice is, not, is important. Uh, crime, uh, density of housing, housing itself, and connectivity. So we can actually, we've started to measure all that. We develop measures through this actual um, research project, and we're now looking to say, can we connect all of that up for all children across Australia? So that's pretty exciting stuff. And qualitative data, and you know, I, you know, one of the big lessons for me, I really think, is the importance of talking to people. And you're probably seeing the go, well, duh. But it doesn't often get done in these sort of projects. Often we rely on the quantitative data, but it doesn't tell you what lies beneath. So we did 50, so if you're a qualitative researcher, you're gonna die about how much data we have. So we did 50 focus groups with parents and service providers and did them in every community. We did 136 interviews. If any of you are qualitative researchers and you wanna join us, please come on board. Um, we actually examined all the local policy documents. And so we had a huge amount, oops, a huge amount of qualitative data because we're interested in saying, what does the quantitative data tell us? But also, what does the qualitative data tell us? Because in essence, from a numbers point of view, we're not going into that many communities. So we need to triangulate that data. We need to have a sense of what's real. And so we developed these things called foundational community factors, which are factors that lay the foundations of a good community for young children. So it's FCFs, not CFCs. Um, and this idea that we just need to understand what's happening for a community. So I'll do this very quickly, but I, I, um, one of the important things for me to say is that we used as much as possible science anal and analysis. And I don't mean just quantitative analysis, we use qualitative analysis. Because what I want to bring to bear for you is that this is real evidence. And 
I think that's very important. I don't want you to drink the Kool-Aid and go, oh, Sharon was a great presenter, but, uh, you know, whatever. I want you to have a look at this stuff and hopefully it will make sense to you. You might not even think I'm a great presenter, but um, I think it's really important that we kind of don't just um, swallow the rhetoric, but we challenge the rhetoric and make sure that we're comfortable with the science. So this is doing three things. We looked at, we were particularly interested in this differentiating stuff what makes communities different. And we were particularly interested in these ones doing better than expected. And so we did three things. We looked at within the community, those two communities, does, does that tell us something? Or that, is that kind of making sense? Is the quant and qual telling us the same? Then we looked across communities, greater than four community pairs, and we said, if there's more than four community pairs telling us something, it's probably real. And then we said, do the qualitative and quantitative findings align? And interestingly, they don't always. Now, that could be measurement or it could just mean we're tapping into something different. So that's the first bit around differentiating factors. And then we realised we did all these interviews and we asked all these people, stakeholders and parents, what is it about your community that you think is important for child development? And we thought, well, why would you throw all of that away? Even though it didn't always differentiate, it did tell us things that parents and stakeholders said were important. So we called these important factors. And then we said, okay, thematically, in those important factors, what are the themes that are really emerging across a number of the communities? So if more than 16 out of the 25 local communities were telling us the same thing, we said, that's probably important. And so we ended up with these differentiating factors and these important factors. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on these differentiating factors. I'm not going to actually read them all out, but I'm going to give you a chance to have a look at them. And when I put them up there, most people are pretty surprised about what they are and sort of saying, well, what do we do next? And I think that's the really challenging bit and, in my view, the exciting bit. So things like um, stigma, which was really interesting. So what we had was communities that were quite... These are two poor communities we're looking at, right? So one community had much more stigma where the other communities were going, oh, you don't want to be a kid from that community. But they had really strong bonding social capital. So they'd kind of hunkered down together. So they were really supportive of each other. But they didn't have any of that bridging capital where they were actually out and reaching out to the rest of the community. And those kids were doing more poorly than the other poor community where the kids were doing better. So stigma is a really interesting kind of social phenomenon. The other thing here was gentrification. And mostly when you go gentrification, people think it's a bad thing. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But in this case, what you had was just greater income diversity. Now, this wasn't about a whole lot of rich people moving in. It was just relatively wealthier, but still sitting in that disadvantaged pocket. And it's that heterogeneity, not just having all the poor people, but having some heterogeneity that meant kids were doing better. And that's probably related to education levels and all those other sorts of things. And then um, things here, local decision making. So as a result of local decision making, novel approaches or locally initi tailored initiatives or solutions, and those kids were doing better. So hang on, this is right in the pocket, right? This is where people are thinking at the moment. Things like historical events where leaders have stepped up. This is all this governance stuff, you know. This is the ability for communities to step up and own themselves and the sorts of things they did. Perceived primary school reputation, perceived early, these are the qualitative one, perceived crime. So this is not, actually, we know there's a total disconnect between actual perception and actual crime rates. So perceive less crime, kids were doing better. And one of the kids today talked about feeling safe, right? Because that's important. Um, and all the housing ones. So these aren't, these aren't the sort of usual suspects, right? Now what's interesting is there wasn't a lot about the sorts of things that we might think is important. So like parks, right? Which we thought for sure would come up. So it didn't come up in this differentiating, but it did in the important. So down here, having good quality parks, family-friendly destinations. So in the qualitative stuff about what parents and stakeholders said, this is important for a community, it did come up. And in fact, what I want to tell you is we think parks are much more important that have come up. And so we've got a grant in at the moment, we're trying to put together a grant, that will allow us to link that really cool GIS data 
with children's development data across the whole country for children in, um, particularly in urban areas, and see is there actually a relationship between those GIS sort of built environment measures and children's development. We think there is, we just think we didn't have a big enough sample size here, and it's certainly coming out in the qual, you know, being away from traffic is important for children. These are all the things that you guys value, walkability. These are the things that parents and stakeholders, this is a range of communities, these are regional and urban communities, are saying, hey, we think these are important for children. Costs of services, service coordination, leadership, locally based groups. Wow, this is the sort of stuff people are really interested in and guess what? They look like they're really important for children's development. So I think it's important to say, I wouldn't suggest that we're putting all of these up and say every single one of these are going to be important for every single community. This is a set of metrics and tools that you can dip in and out of. And I was going to say that um, Kayano has actually done this. He's actually taken the kicks measures and used them. So you can talk to him about how easy or hard it was. Um, but the idea is that you bring the community context and the metrics together and the qualitative data, the, quali the ability to talk to people is fundamental. In my view, if you just do the quant and you don't do the qual, you're pretty much underestimating how to engage with the community and what they're saying. But I think you can bring them together um, in common themes or groups and it might be when you've spoken to people, they're going, what's really emerging here is X and that's where you focus your attention, be it parks or services or whatever. So it's a great diagnostic but it's not like and then the answer is 64. And also that these um, foundational community factors can converge for effort but they might be on the pathway for early childhood development. So for example, high quality early childhood education and care is on the pathway to early childhood development. Now, um, the weird thing is, not weird, the interesting thing is this relationship between the um, FCFs. So for example, here is a quote that says, if you spoke to someone in the council, they'd say, we've got everything here, what's the problem? If you speak to people about what's important is having this range of family-friendly destinations. So on face value, you'd go, okay, well, that's kind of all working. But, you know, then you've got this problem of people can't get there. And it's only when you talk to people and you ask people that they realise, you know, this lovely quote, <laughs> that they work for 45 minutes to attend. A t so, you know... Um, there's a very, very nice program or project that's going on in Cincinnati where they looked at why women weren't going to antenatal care. And what they realised was they didn't know how to get there, there wasn't the right transport, and they started this little kind of quality improvement cycle where they rang people, told them what bus to take, etc., etc. Women started coming to antenatal care and actually they eliminated very low birth weight babies being born in that area. So a really hard metric, right? And simply because they didn't go, we're making a better antenatal care service, they just had to help people get there. And until we're thinking about transport and walkability as part of a community, we can build services till the cows come home. It's no good if nobody comes. You've got to look at who's coming and who's not coming and why. And getting underneath, kind of lifting the hood on services and looking inside can be very scary. But if you do that, you'll find what's the real numerator and what's the real denominator in who's coming and not coming. Until you lift the hood, it's really hard to know. And then this, which is the um, public transport issue. So these public transport issues, part of these kind of metrics we're talking about, they start to tell you the full story. So if I just stopped at families accessing services, it might look really good until like people go, oh, we've got all these services. It's not until you kind of look at what lies beneath that you start to see some stuff. So why are, why are these things important? Well, I think they're important for a number of reasons. First of all, they're evidence-based, and that's really important. You should ask yourself that. What, who's telling me this, and are they evidence-based? And then um, I think one of the really challenging things with a lot of the place-based efforts is this sense of where do we prioritise our effort. So once you do some of these things, what happens is you have the opportunity then to go, OK, where do we prioritise our effort? Like, there's a whole range of things. What do people think? What do our communities think is the important place to prioritise our effort? Because you cannot do it all at once. And then what's the advocacy effort that goes around that? Um, the potential points of intervention, this, the stakeholder engagement. 
um, the biggest winner out of all of this was the stakeholder engagement, that people were saying, we want to tell you about our community and we're going to tell the people who matter about that community. And then this, um, what I think is really important, which is moving beyond anecdotal information. I'm doing another project that's actually doing the lifting of the hood and trying to find out what are the metrics at a service level. And when we first sometimes meet with a local government area, the first thing they say to us is, oh, we already know that. And then when we go, but what do you really know? And then you realise that people actually don't know that. They've got anecdotal, so-and-so says, I can't get into this. And that's still important. The end of one stories are still important. But I think we need to move beyond that so we have a sense of where do we prioritise effort, where do we start, and how do we know that change means improvement? Because change can sometimes not mean improvement, it just means change. Um, and I think particularly with all these place-based initiatives, I think this is helpful. So I think that these um, foundational community factors are really important for how to help local councils and communities get a much clearer picture of the community and how they're tracking and how they're tracking in early childhood development, which I would count as kind of zero to eight. And, and I think there comes a time when we need these metrics to galvanise effort and also to, to kind of measure effort over time. I'm just having a look at my time. I'm doing all right, I think. So there are some caveats with all of this. Um, this is not a randomised control trial of something like a pill, right? So if you were taking a pill right now, you'd want to know they did fancy randomised control trials, they gave it to some people and not other people, and you saw this direct, what we call, causal relationship between taking the pill and maybe dropping your blood pressure or whatever. We're, we're not in that field with this. Um, at least not at the moment. We're in this kind of much muckier area. So I think, I think what we can say with the FCFs is there are, are kind of signal areas of influence on early childhood development. We've got the um, literature that tells us these things should be important, right? So they tell us a bit about the what and they tell us a bit about the how and the why, but they don't tell us the how much. So I can't tell you, well, you should have three parks and not two parks, and if you do that, you'll have better early childhood development. It, and I don't think it's ever going to work like that. But hopefully over time, if we start stacking some of these things, if we start thinking about parks and transport and services and governance and start thinking about where do we place our effort and where are our metrics, then we might start to see over time those wonderful slow-moving outcome metrics move in the right direction. And move in the right direction not just because we want early childhood development to improve for everyone, which we do, we want to make sure we keep an eye on the gap because we can do a whole lot of this stuff and not address the gap at all. There's um, a very, um, uh, I think, cool kind of saying that um, has come out of the literature, which is this idea of the inverse care law. It came out of the UK, actually, uh, where they realised they were providing the worst healthcare services for those who needed the best healthcare services. And um, sadly, in Australia, we have the inverse care law at play. So we often provide the worst quality services to the poorest areas. And if you look at all the early childhood education and care evidence, that would really hold true, that essentially the poorest quality early childhood education and care tends to be in the poorest areas and vice versa. And so... This idea of focusing this sort of effort in areas that are galvanised, that have some momentum, but also can think about the gap and disadvantage and equity. Remember, equity is about that idea of being providing according to need. Then I think we might be kind of on our way to thinking about great communities for bringing up children. And remember, bringing up children is not about children. It's also about children and families. So uh, the kind of what next. So we've been thinking a lot about this. We would really love people to start using these, and I'll show you some tools that we've got, anybody in the room really. Um, start to use these and let us know kind of how it's going. These are not licensed. We don't own them. Um, we would love them to be used. Our only caveat is give us a call so we can kind of tell you how they kind of work because... Um, using things badly is not a great idea, but these are not, we don't own any of these, we don't want to, but um, we think there's an opportunity and we think there's an opportunity in particular around the quantitative and the qualitative together, which is the first thing. 
Um, one of the reasons we'd love you to give us a call if you're going to use them is that once we get more and more data, we can turn some of that qualitative stuff into quantitative, which is always easier to sell, really, to be honest, if you're trying to do some advocacy. So that's a really important thing for us. And then um, finally, we know that some of this work still needs to happen in terms of the science, which is the stuff I've told you about, which is the GIS work that we're doing. So um, we have this, which I'll show you in a moment. So there's a, an actual manual of the measures and how you measure them. So uh, my email's on the front slide, or you can just Google me via my email, and uh, I can send you that, um, that document. We don't have it on the web because we just didn't want every want to just pick it up and go, oh, we just won't do this and we'll do this. So we, it's a conversation starter, but we don't plant it. We're not selling it or anything like that. And so the question is kind of the what next. So um, I'll just walk you through about where we've been. We actually started in... Two, so all those people that you saw, those collaborators, um, we started in 2007, we've developed these FCFs, and now what we'd really like to do is take it to scale, and we'd like more and more people using it, and, oops, and talking to us. Right. And, um, and really informing place-based initiatives. That's what we'd really like. And here are the different reports you can get. This is the actual summary of everything we've done in a really nicely laid out report with a lovely executive summary. Here's the draft manual which you can ring us and we'll send to you. Um, and here is what you get at the end, this community profile you can generate. So again, Logan, what would life be without Logan? Um, so um, the opportunity, I guess, to be able to have a sense of what are the data telling you about your community. So kind of here's my last bit of kind of um, opportunity, I guess, to, to put a call to action. One is make bold decisions. So um, we do a lot of tinkering at the edges for a whole range of reasons, but you can see some of the things we put in those differentiating factors required bold decisions. Should we knock down a crappy centre that's not really being used? Should we build mixed housing there? Should we build a really nice centre? Because actually, like, people like nice centres. Um, one of the stories that we have is that uh, people actually got together and build, built a nice centre and people loved it and came to it and built social capital and then improved early childhood development because the people that were coming wanted to live in that area, which is the, the downside is the gentrification, the upside is you get this better social capital. Um, so make bold decisions is my first sort of call to action. The other is, this is a, this was a study you would never ever be able to do, but if any of you are interested, it's called Moving to Opportunity, where they actually moved people. So it was done in uh, North America. So they randomised people to actually stay where they are, have a voucher to move wherever they wanted, or actually move them. And, um, which you wouldn't be able to do these days. But interestingly, this is the age of the child when the parents moved, and this is the gain. And you can see here, the younger the child, the more the gain. So there was actually no gain for the parents, and there was gains for the children. This is in percentage gain um, through making it in making a better life, and it was younger children who were exposed to a better community did better. Fascinating. I'm not suggesting we do it now, but it's fascinating. And the other is this, I kind of like this, this is in the built environment space. I don't know if you know anything about purpose-built environments, but it's this idea of actually going in, knocking down the crappy stuff, building new stuff, this is building mixed housing, and actually, because mixed is better than just social housing, mixed housing and actually improving outcomes for children. This is bold stuff. Go in, take the bulldozer, knock it down, build something new, re redistribute your funding so that you build it somewhere else. That's making great communities for children. So, I'm going to leave you with two quotes. One is by James Baldwin. I don't know if any of you know who James Baldwin uh, was. He was a, quite a famous black writer, um, sort of quite um, prominent in the 1960s in the US. He was black and gay. You can imagine what that was like in the 1960s. And um, if you're ever interested in a documentary, he has a documentary called I Am Not Your Negro. And if you're fascinated with um, the US and how they've um, not evolved in terms of racism, it's worth um, a watch. Um, but he says, not everything that is faced can be changed but nothing can be changed until it is faced. In other words, if we don't have the metrics and the data, we definitely can't do anything about it. We might not be able to do about everything about everything, we might not be able to change everything, but we can't 
do those things unless we've actually looked at them in the first place. And the second and my last slide is from Gabriella Mistral. Gabriella Mistral is a Nobel Prize winning poet, South American poet. Interestingly, she herself did not have children, but I completely love this poem, which is, many things we need can wait, the child cannot. Now is the time his bones are being formed, his blood is being made, and his mind is being developed. To him we cannot say tomorrow, his name is today. Thank you. Thank you.